Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Let's do the regular thing. Let me make sure you can see and hear me okay. Uh, especially since I'm using a new camera today. So hopefully it's more clear than it's been in the past. But let's make sure you can see and hear me. Can you see and hear me? All right. Okay, Madison, I can see and hear you. Fantastic. Hopefully it's good and sharp. That's kind of the goal of this new camera. All right. And thank you. Afnan, thank you. All right. We are going to jump right into today's lecture because we've only got an hour and a half. I want to make sure we get it all. And so with that, let us switch over to our presentation. Um, labor and Capital Part 2, this time it's personal. And it really is. We are really going to bring this down to a very, very personal level. So what we're going to do is we are going to look really at three readings, and then I'm going to tee up a, a, uh, a video for you. Uh, the human Humans Need Not Apply is a video. It's a fantastic video, really a thought-provoking video. I'll tee that up for you. But what we need to get through today is Lady Chatterley's Lover. That's right. We're looking at a banned book. An Employee's View of the Labor Question by Carnegie, and Man and Machine by Gandhi. Yes, we're going to read some Gandhi that you've never seen before. I can almost promise you that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Lady Chatterley's Lover, this is actually what you're going to be looking at is an excerpt from the book, an excerpt from one of the chapters that really has two characters in it. We have Connie, who is Lady Chatterley, so Connie, and her husband, Clifford. And Clifford owns a mine, okay? A mine, as, as Gimli would say. And he, of course, has a whole bunch of employees that work the mine. And this is back in the early 1800s, pretty darn awful work. And so Lady Chatterley, Connie, and her husband Clifford are kind of having a debate of sorts about the role of a mine owner and the role of the employees. So let's take a look at this. So first thing, what is the most important thing that you need to have to be successful in a capitalist system? Well, I maintain that the most important thing to have is in the title itself, capital. And that's really what this ex excerpt from Lady Chatterley's Lover is talking about, is how capital should be used. Remember, capital can mean anything from money to land, factories, resources, things that generate wealth. Okay, remember, capital generates wealth. And so to be successful in a capitalist system, you need things that generate wealth. And we've talked about this in previous lectures. We're going to go deep today. So we're going to talk a bit. Let's, let's explore this idea of what is today called redistribution of wealth. Now, if we look at this in today's lingo, today's nomenclature, redistribution of wealth is kind of taking from the wealthy to redistribute, to give to those with less wealth. And we already know that in our economic system here in the United States anywhere, we practice some degree of redistribution of wealth. We talked about this when we read about David Potter and the American form of capitalism. So I own a home, I pay taxes on my home. A home and the land it's on is capital. I pay taxes to pay for school, okay? So that is a form of redistribution of wealth. I am, and you are all taxed so that we can subsidize other things. We can subsidize different programs. That's an example of redistribution of wealth. Well, let's see what Clifford, the mine owner, 
has to say about the idea of redistribution of wealth. He says here, the point is not take all thou hast and give it to the poor, but use all thou hast to encourage the industry and give work to the poor. It is only way it is the only way to feed all the mouths and clothe all the bodies. Give away all we have to the poor spells starvation for the poor just as much as for ourselves. So he's taking a very conservative stance on this, which is to say, listen, I have capital, I have wealth, and the very best thing I can do with this wealth is create jobs. And thereby, other people can earn a living by working. Um, very traditional, not incorrect view of, of the responsibility of capital, of, of the conservative aspect of redistribution of wealth. However, I want to play with something here. Um, he says something at the end that that I think is somewhat loaded. He says, giving away all we have to the poor spells starvation for the poor. Okay. Um, I want to play with this idea. So give me your thoughts. Do you agree with this and why? Or do you disagree with this and why? So let's take a minute to think about that. Do you agree that giving away all we have for the, to the poor or giving to the poor spells starvation for the poor? Or do you disagree? And be sure to say why. So let's play with this for a moment. Okay, let's take a look at some of your thoughts here. So Nicholas doesn't quite know. That's fine, right? It's actually the truth is both. Let's play with this. Now, Brock says, I agree. I think it's like the example of giving a fish to a man so he can eat for a day versus teaching him to fish so he can eat for a lifetime. Well, now that's a, that adage has held up and it's, a, it's an interesting adage. But let me ask you this. Um, teaching him to fish. Well, that takes money. So in order to teach a man to fish, he has to get a fishing pole. He has to get a license. He has to get to train, get the training. And all of you who fish know that there's actually an awful lot to fishing. And it can take years to learn to become a good fisherman. Well, now, are you willing to pay for that poor person to become a fisherman because that's what we're doing with you guys right now at Salt Lake Community College 60% of your tuition is subsidized by taxpayers which means we believe that and it's totally true we believe it is a good investment to train people in job skills but that investment requires capital. So, yes, teaching a man to fish, feed them for a lifetime, but that takes a few years of investment. Are we willing to redistribute wealth to make that investment? Um, let's see, both ways agree and disagree. You know, it's really a tricky thing, right? So on one hand, let me paint the extremes for you. 
The extremes will say, well, heck, if I give to the poor, they're just going to go off and get drunk and take drugs and they're going to do, you know, I'm, I'm not going to support that. And so giving money to them is throwing good money after bad. On the other hand, if we say, well, no, most of the time, because of the profit motive, people want to improve. They want to push themselves. And so if we give them opportunities to learn, they're going to learn. If we give them opportunities to go to work and to give them help on child care, they're going to go to work. And so really, to what degree are we willing to invest and redistribute wealth to help people get on their feet? Now, to Clifford, our friend here, he's, he's the far right conservative side, which is, you know what, they can't make a decision to save their lives. There's no way they're going to make good financial decisions. We should just forget it, right? But it's not that simple. Okay, let's come back to our presentation then. So, um, so we're over here. Now, another thing that comes up is whether or not folks are forced to work. Now, remember, we talked about this, right? Back in the old days, back in the old days, there were two ways you would work. One is family tradition. My last name is Schiffbauer. That means shipbuilder, which means my family made ships. If your name is Smith, if your name is Tanner, if your name is any of these things that are related with a profession, odds are it was by family tradition that your family made a living. Or it was through slavery, indentured servitude, um, forced labor. That's how we got work done. But then we became enlightened. Don't worry, <laughs> you know, we're going we're gonna to tease this. I'm being tongue in cheek. We became enlightened and said, hey, anybody can do whatever they want, whatever the market will bear. Remember, laissez-faire, free market. So as Connie says, but you make them work for you. They live the life of your coal, you know, of your coal mine. And Clifford said, not at all. Every beetle finds its own food. No one man is forced to work for me. Well, now here's the issue. Technically, they're not forced. They're not slaves and so forth, right? And their names aren't minor. Um, but here's the thing. There is exploitation of need. And that's very much what's going on here. So these folks have no capital, no money. They, have, they are not mobile. Okay, they can't just get up and move. Today, we're very mobile. They cannot just get up and move and go where there's more opportunity, okay? And in many ways, they might be, you know, in debt up to their eyeballs to the company. There's an old song, old, old, old mining song called, I Owe My Soul to the Company Store. That's because a lot of these employees would take credit out from the company store just to eat and to pay their rent, which the company owned. And in return, they'd work for the company, but they could never quit because they could never pay off the debt. So they became indentured servants that way. So yes, technically they're in a free market, but you are only as free as your resources allow you to be. I want you to think about that. For example, right now, I am free to fly to Paris. I have the right. I have a passport. I am free to fly to Paris. However, I do not have the resources. I cannot afford to visit Paris. Therefore, I am no more free than a man sitting in jail right now because we are only as free as our resources allow us to be. And these employees are not free. OK, so just something to play with there. All right. Clifford also goes on to say that there exists an absolute gulf between the ruling and the serving classes. OK, I just wanted to see what was there. Um, 
I want you to think about this, an absolute gulf between the ruling and serving classes. Well, a gulf is a gap, but it's not just a little gap. It's a huge gap, right? I can't do a huge gap with this tiny window. It's a huge gap. And absolute means there's nothing you can do about it. It is an environmental constant. It just is. The sun shines, water is wet. There is an absolute gulf between the ruling and the serving classes. And to him, this is just the way it's supposed to be. Um, everybody is born into their lot. Remember the Protestant work ethic said that everything that you're born into is your calling. So you're born into this lot as a servant, as a worker, you're required to work your butt off. And as a landowner, you're required to provide jobs, and that's it. There is no upward mobility in Clifford's eyes. So think about this as you go through the reading. And as he talks about this, let's read what Clifford says. He says, the masses are unalterable. You can't change them. Um, it is one of the most monumentous facts of social science. Panem and circuses, bread and circuses. The only, uh, only today, education is, is one of the bad substitutes for circuses. What is wrong today? Um, what is wrong today is that we've made a profound hash of the circuses part of the program, and poisoned our masses with a little education. Okay, so like I say, let's unpack this. Let's see what he's talking about. First of all, let's talk about penem and circuses. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Bread and circuses. So as it says here, it's the cynical formula that the masses, you and me, we're the masses. Ordinary people like you and me can be distracted from their unfortunate state through entertainment. So... It's, yeah, life sucks. Life is awful. But so long as we provide entertainment, then we, you know, they'll forget their troubles. Okay. So I want to ask you, um, well, it's different question for the next coming up. So think about, do we practice kind of bread and circuses today? Is this something that is part of our lives? Now, personally, and this is just me, just me, I think we do. Um, I think that um, we have all kinds of entertainment at our fingertips. We just signed up for Disney Plus. So that means I have Netflix, Prime, and Disney Plus. Of course, we have the internet. We can surf constantly. You know, we can get onto Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, um, you know, TikTok and so forth. And we can practice all kind of vitriol and feel like we're engaged and in things. But all we're really doing is distracting ourselves from what's really going on and from what's really important. So I personally believe that we do fall prey to this, that we... Um, kind of forget what's important and focus on the entertainment and the and the you know righteous indignation of the moment. But he doesn't just talk about the the bread and circuses. What he says is that we've kind of wrong button lawn, um, we've kind of ruined this formula with a little education. Now he's really concerned about education. As he says, we're poisoning our masses with a little education. The masses being people that should work for him and make him rich. I also have a little, another quote here by Alexander Pope saying, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So tell me, why do you think somebody like Clifford, who owns all the capital and employs the masses, and wants to keep them working for him, why would he think that a little education poisons the masses? Why is education, knowledge, a dangerous thing? 
So let's play with that question. Okay, let's see what you've got. So you might still be typing it out. I totally get that. So let's bring it in. Here we go. There's a little bit of a lag. So I always know be patient, right? So Brock, um, a little education would be a dangerous would be dangerous because it would teach people to think on a higher level than normal and thus challenge the system um, that the leading class has in place. I agree 100%. That's what I think, is if you're ignorant to your misery, ignorant to your state, and ignorant to the relationship you have with the ruling class, then there's nothing to question. But when you start to learn things, when you start to get some insight, you start to challenge the status quo. And the last thing that Clifford wants is for anyone to challenge the status quo. Brock, I completely agree with you. Uh, let's see, Madison, the masses will learn all the possible um, unfair treatment and demand more, demand more, and maybe leave the employer to venture off and create their own, especially today. You know, it, very good. I like the way you're connecting it with today. Um, employees, the more we learn, the more we demand because we learn our value. We learn the value that we provide to the company. And we start to learn that we have skills and competencies that maybe we could take somewhere else or even start our own business. So, you know, education to somebody who is exploitive in their work practices is not a good thing. Um, I won't name names, but there's a company that one of my kids works for who I believe tends to exploit need. And they do not encourage their employees to get an education. They do not have a tuition reimbursement program. As a matter of fact, they kind of poo-poo people who start to talk about, I'm thinking of going back to college. That's because they pretty much want to keep them on the docks working. That's my own personal take on this particular company. Um, so yeah, um, uh, example, me too. Yes. What a great example, Madison, where you start to realize, you know what, this whole director's couch system you've got going on, this is bull crap to the umpteenth degree. It doesn't need to be like this where everybody else is kind of, what do you mean? It's always been like this. You got to pay to play. Yeah, we can do better. Very good, very good. Okay, let's come back to our presentation. All right, so um, this one I wanna play with a little bit. I just wanna show you something. So one of the things that, um, um, Matt, uh, let's see. Oh, Nicholas, if a company can influence the school system, they can also be, yes, can also be a problem. Very good. Um, one of the things that Connie says that I love, I love, she says, their lives, meaning the employees, their lives are industrialized and hopeless, and so are ours. Now, I can totally see why their lives would be industrialized and hopeless. Industrialized, part of a heartless, soulless system, a cog in a relentless machine, um, 
you know, and hopeless, desperate, and without hope for a better tomorrow. These people are just meant to be, you know, chewed up. Let me show you something, and I'll talk through this a little bit. There's this incredible movie from 1927 called uh, Metropolis. You've probably seen segments and pieces of it, but I want to show you something here just as an example. So we'll come here, turn on the sound to it, and I'm going to bring this. Actually, we'll stop that. So, here we go. So, it's pretty clear um, to see why that is a, you know, hopeless, soulless, industrialized life, right? But she doesn't just say their lives are hopeless and industrialized. She says, so are ours. So, you know, think about this for a moment. Why would her life be industrialized and hopeless in those of Clifford? Well, it just really comes down to this. As Clifford says, we must keep the form of life intact, which is to say, we serve the system. That God that was demanding a sacrifice in Metropolis we serve at the whim of the system. I, uh, I told you early on in this class that we would explore the idea of whether the system existed for you or whether you existed for the system. And the way that Clifford and, and Connie see it is that we exist for the system. Everybody does. Which means if you want to do something different, too bad. You can't do it. You have to make money. Wake up, you got to make money, as the lyrics go. And it is all about the Benjamins. And so your life is industrialized and hopeless, even when you're at middle class or above, 
because you're working for the system. That's the concern she brings in. Okay, so um, won't worry about, you know, it's a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre. Every existing thing is born without reason, prolongs itself out of weakness, and dies by chance. It's a very bleak view of, of the world and existence, and that's what Connie has, okay? Um, hey, yeah, Nicholas, he caught the quote. All right. But it's true, right? Wake up, you got to make money. Ugh, it's a, it's a, it's a disturbing thought. Okay, we got to keep moving because we got to finish by about twelve thirty or so. Okay, an employer's view of the labor question by Andrew Carnegie. Now, here's the thing, and this is what I love. I love Carnegie. I'm going to tell you why. He's not this altruistic you know, capitalist saint. He's a, you know, capitalist, you know, robber baron bastard, just like the rest of them. He's in it to make money. He's in it to make money. He is in it to make money. Make no mistake. However, he's smart. He knows that the best way to make money is to create a fantastic environment for his employees. Now, for you guys, you're kind of like, well, duh, that makes sense. Take care of your employees and they'll take care of the customers and the customers will make profit for you. You know, people service profit. You get that. But back then, this was like revolutionary, almost like, you know, socialist thinking. Now, again, he's not doing this because he's like this, you know, you know, enlightened person in terms of the human condition. He just wants to find better ways to make money. And let's see what he says are the ways to help people to help make money. He wants industrial peace. When when management and employees are um, crashing are at odds, are at loggerheads, nobody is better off. Nobody's making money. Nobody's progressing. Nobody's doing well. You see this nonsense going on here with strikes and so forth. Nobody is benefiting from this kind of, of violence. And so um, he understands that the way to make money is by having peace in the system. Well, how are we going to get this kind of industrial peace? He has four steps. You'll look for these in the reading. One is he wants to compensate employee based on a sliding scale in proportion to the prices received. What does that mean? Well, in a normal business in his time, let's see, you're paid a dollar an hour, you make a dollar an hour. And if, if the product that you're making, the price goes way up and you're making tons of money and lots of money is coming in, you're still making a dollar an hour, a dollar an hour. Well, he says, no, you should be paid according to how much profit that product is bringing in. So if I can sell it for $2, then you make a dollar an hour. If I can sell it for $10, well, now you should be making, you know, two dollars an hour or whatever right now this was revolutionary to him but this is something that's actually in regular practice today um we can see it in different ways if you're paid by commission you're paying according to what you bring in when i worked for intel corporation they actually had a policy where my salary the salary of all of us employees was actually below market, which is to say we made less per year than our counterparts in other tech companies. Were we upset? No, because I'll tell you why. Our profit sharing bonus was huge. I mean, really big, right? So that means if the company had profitable years, we made bank. And if the company did not have profitable years, we did not make as much. And so that is how Intel would tie profitability to our pay. 
and we love the system. And that's what he's recommending here. OK, revolutionary. All right. Number two. Proper organization led by the best managers that confer freely with employees. Now, once again, to you guys, to us, hopefully, this is something you experience and you understand and you get it. This was nuts crazy back in the day. Back then, you want to know how you got to be a manager? First of all, you had to be male. You had to be male and you had to... Um, be the son or son-in-law or nephew or whatever of the company owner. It was all nepotism. You had to be a white male who was related to the owner. And so all the managers would just simply be the white male members of the family. No skill, no experience, no training, no education. They were put in as the elite, the blue bloods, and they didn't confer with the employees because they were the blue buds, bloods. They knew better. Carnegie's saying, no, 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 no. You hire the best managers, you train them, you get them up and running, and then you tell them to confer with the employees and create some, some you know, collaboration. This was crazy. But remember, it's all about industrial peace, peaceful arbitration. You're not going to do strikes and you're not going to do lockouts. I'll explain strikes and lockouts here in a moment. But you're going to sit down and talk. You're going to sit down and talk and figure out the best solution, one that fits everybody's needs peacefully, because strikes and lockouts cost money. And um, ultimately, number four, and this is what it all comes down to, no interruption of work. No interruption of the work. Because if you're not producing, you're not making money. And Carnegie's all about making money. But he says, hey, so long as we're compensating people based on the profits we make and we give them the very best managers we can train and they confer freely and we sit down and we negotiate in good faith according to terms and conditions of working there, policies and pay and so forth, and we have a constant flow of work, everybody's going to be happy and I'm going to get rich and they'll be happy as well. Today, this is pretty much standard, but back then, this was revolutionary. By the way, strikes versus lockouts. A strike is when employees refuse to work, so they leave the factory and they'll pick it around. A lockout is where the company will actually kick out the employees and say, you can't work here this week. We're going to close the factory for the whole week, whole month, until you guys you know, re agree to come back to work at this lower contract. They're really just tactics that are based on the idea of who has the longest runway, who has the deepest resources to outlast the other. If the employee union thinks they can outlast the company, they'll go ahead and strike. If the company thinks they can outlast the union, they'll do a lockout. Either way, you have an interruption of work. In Carnegie, that's one of the cardinal sins. No interruption of work. So look for those references when you do the reading. Another thing he talks about is employee ownership of the company. He actually has mixed feelings about the idea of employee ownership. He really likes the idea that it increases the employee's stake in the company. Um, if it's not your company and it's just a jab, you don't care. You show up, you do your work, you leave. It's not a big deal. Whereas if you are a part owner in that company and you are a part owner in the profits, um, yeah, you, you're going to work a little bit more. You're going to work a little bit harder. You have skin in the game. You have a dog in the race, all right? All that stuff. However, Carnegie wasn't totally sold on the idea. And here was his concern. He said, listen, these people are really good, solid, skilled workers, and they know what they're doing, and they do it really well. 
But that doesn't make them business people. That doesn't make them, um, you know, give them the the long view, the strategic thinking, the insight, the industry acumen necessary to make really important, critical, hard decisions. And when you have a company of 50,000 people and 50,000 of them are owners and 50,000 of them think that you should listen to them because they have a part ownership in the company, you're never going to get agreement. You're never going to be able to please everyone. And it's just going to create a lot of thrash. Now, he has points, but he's right and wrong. Uh, we can talk later on about how it really works. But those are the concerns that you should look out for from Carnegie in the reading. Okay. Here's a quote from Andrew Carnegie. I shall argue the strong man converse, um, conversely. Know when to compromise, and all principles can be compromised to serve a greater principle. Um, hey, listen, when you have a greater goal, which is no slow down and work, no, sh you know, shut down, you're totally willing to sit down and negotiate and compromise with employees to make sure the system is working. So he was willing to do that. Not many of his contemporaries were willing to do that. Okay, we're firing along great. Remember, we got to get through this until about 1230. So let's move on to Mahatma Gandhi. I apologize. Normally we work in some breaks and you're not getting those. And so you're probably like, dude, I'm drinking from a fire hose. But you can come back and watch this later on to kind of pick up the key points. Okay. Man and machine. Here's his deal. Think back to some of the problems that we talked about, um, about, you know, division of labor, the things that both Adam Smith the father of modern economics, and Karl Marx, the father of socialism, brought up. Um, we love the division of labor because we can become very, very skilled and efficient in a very, very specific task. Remember, turn the dial, pull the lever, push the button over and over and over. We become very, very good at that and very quick and very efficient. Um, but then there were concerns about that. Remember, um, Adam Smith said in a life like that, people will lose the capacity for critical thinking and for problem solving and imagination and innovation. And they'll become pretty much stupid beasts. And Karl Marx says, dude, I hear you because work is our species essence. We need to be able to see ourselves and express ourselves in our work. That is what we do. And when all we do is pull the lever, turn the knob and push the button, you can't express yourself. You cannot fulfill your species essence in that kind of work. Okay, you remember all that, right? You're good. Okay, so let's let's see what um, um, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, gripe was. Well, he says, listen, what we're really doing, he felt, is we are placing the emphasis on the wrong syllable. So capitalism really loves efficiency. You know, produce more with less. We adore efficiency. Um, and, and we're always trying to figure out how to be more efficient, how to produce more with less investment. Um, but less investment also means less labor, right? We are totally willing to fill our factories with machines and computers and robots of every ilk in the pursuit of efficiency, all right? That's what capitalism does. On the other hand, Gandhi says we should be placing the emphasis on labor, valuing the role of work over efficiency. Now, this means that, yes, you will have some very over-engineered over hierarchical processes that involve lots and lots and lots of people that really do very little in this whole over-engineered 
Byzantine system, but they're working. These people are working. And to Gandhi, the idea of laying somebody off and replacing them with a machine was abhorrent to the umpteenth level. I mean, you're putting a machine ahead of a human being. Efficiency should not, you know, push out the value of labor. That's what Gandhi is saying. Now, you also have to understand where the dude is coming from, right? So, as you see from this graphic here, India is the second most populous country in the world. There are billions of Indians, right? So, think about this. There are about 300,000 Americans, 300,000 people living in the U.S., but there's like 1.7 billion people living in India, okay? So that means that if our, and I understand right now we're in a COVID-induced recession. I understand our, our unemployment numbers are much higher, but let's just say for a moment that our unemployment is 10%. That means we can produce in this country with 90% of 300 million um, and do just fine. Well, that if, if we had, you know, 90 or 90% of 300 million, whatever that was, working in India, that means your unemployment rate would be something like 80% or something. I'm making these numbers up. But your unemployment rate in India would be massive. So there's a lot of people to employ, okay? And trust me, I've, um, I've been in India. I did some work in India. And yeah, they over-engineer everything. There are 18 people to do one person's job over there. But that's because they value labor. I'll give you an example. When you rent a car in India, a driver comes with the car. So, whereas here in the U.S., we rent a car, we go out and get in the car, and we drive off and head to the business building or whatever, there, the driver comes with the car. The driver takes you there. By the way, you're grateful to have an Indian driver because they are excellent, excellent drivers, and they need to be in that, in that system. But then when you go off to work, where's the driver? Sitting in the car for eight hours because they come with the car. Now, you and I might be going, are you freaking kidding me? That is like insane. Well, it's a job. And they've got 1.7 billion people to employ. We wouldn't even begin to know how to do that. Okay. Um, it's also a question of perspective, right? So, Capitalism really likes the efficiency and to deliver more product and better features and better quality at lower prices. Whereas Gandhi's view is much more about allowing people to fulfill their species essence in their work. Um, I'm going to go on to, to talk about it through here. Um, it's not that he's necessarily against machines. I want to be clear about that. And in the reading, you will see that he loves the Singer sewing machine. He says the Singer sewing machine is a great example of a good machine. In fact, he calls it a love story because the story, as he tells it in the reading, is Singer was this businessman and so on and so forth, inventor, and he saw his poor wife they're sewing clothes day in, day out, little sewing and needle and so on. And he said, you know what? Now, of course, in that day and age, that was her job, right? She would sew the clothes. And he's like, that looks miserable. I don't want my wife miserable. I'm going to invent a machine that makes her life, her job more enjoyable. It doesn't replace her. It makes her work more fulfilling. So, for example, 
right now, you know, I've got uh, I've got the, the this new camera. Hopefully, it's nice and crisp and clean for you. I have this great microphone. I have good lighting. I have a narrow depth of field. Um, all of this technology, all these machines are allowing me to do my job better. They're not replacing me. They're allowing me to do my job better. And yeah, this is very fulfilling. I love doing this. And when I have technology that helps me do it, all the better. So machines that help you in that way, he's all for. Okay. Um, ultimately for Gandhi, the goal is happiness. He would agree with um, Karl Marx saying that work fulfills our species essence. He says that when work is decentralized, meaning everybody is doing their own thing, gig work, small businesses, entrepreneurs, things like that. He says when, when uh, work is decentralized, the end to be sought is human happiness combined with full mental and moral growth. This can be achieved under decentralization, right? We're all doing our own thing and loving it. And we're craftsmen. Whereas with a centralized system where all the power resides with one company and we're all doing, you know, um, this division of labor stuff. Um, centralization as a system is and should be is not in is inconsistent with a nonviolent structure of society. Meaning, if there's capital and if there's labor, these two will always be fighting because, you know, we are not fulfilled and expressing ourselves in the same way. Remember a few modules ago, we said it's the naughtiest of problem, a problem that's going to be with us for decades. Yep. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, quote for, for Gandhi's is from Adam Savage of the Mythbusters. I'm obsessed with the form of a toolbox. The idea of a portable kit that has everything you might need ignites something inside of me. It's like Batman's utility belt. Now, if you know anything about Adam Savage, you know he's a creator. He's a doer. He, he makes things. He loves to make things. But for him, the idea that tools, having the right tool for the job, ignites something in him and conjures the, feel, the feeling of Batman's utility belt, that's him fulfilling his species essence through his craft. Okay. All right, we're almost there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply tee up Humans Need Not Apply. This is a video you're going to watch. It is a great video. It all comes down to this question, and I'm going to actually have us chime in. So everyone, wake up. Wake up. If you're multitasking, doing something else, I get it. Don't worry. I'm not calling you out. But I need you with me because I'm going to ask you to think about something and, and, and add it in. So I want you to answer this question. What can you do or what will you be able to do that a machine, computer, or a robot cannot? So in other words, why is an employer or a customer going to hire you rather than use a machine, a robot, or a computer, okay? So think about that and give me your thoughts.
Okay, let's take a look at this. Your answers are awesome, by the way. So um, Madison said, handle customer relations, um, escalation management. Yes, it takes emotional intelligence to be able to really ascertain, understand, and then figure out a solution to customer problems and, and issues. This is absolutely something that a human being can do better than anything else right now. Um, so Brock, you said think critically. Yes. Okay. Critical thinking, which is why we do these classes. Critical thinking is everything, right? If all you're supposed to do in a class is just repeat back what was in the textbook, I got news for you. A computer can do that better than you. But no, we want to play with these ideas. We want to think critically. You're absolutely correct. Um, so let's see. Uh, Brock, you go on to say act with emotion. Yes, emotional intelligence, being able to uh, practice empathy and connection at a, at a human level, human relations. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think it's... Um, I think it's, it was Nathan. No, no, it wasn't Nathan. Nathaniel or something. I apologize, sir. Um, let's see. Honestly, there isn't much robots can't do nowadays. Well, we're going to explore that because, guys, he's right, right? Robots could do just about everything, but we're going to explore that. Um, upsell. <laughs> yeah. That's a real value to the human condition. But you're right, Madison. You're absolutely right. Um, make more money, right? Um, so machines can't understand all the customer needs and emotions. That's right. They're getting better at it. This facial recognition stuff is able to kind of figure out um, what the person is saying with their face, right? So it's a lot different than... so. Computers are starting to figure that out, but to be able to work with it, yeah, humans still prefer to work with humans. Um, they're actually doing some things with nurses, for example. There are robot nurses out there, but when you're in pain and when you're scared and when you're vulnerable and you have, you know, kind of an existential threat going on in your life as a patient, you want somebody who has been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and can practice empathy. The robot nurses can't do that yet. Okay, so guys, excellent. You're, you're bang on the money, right? Let me show you what we're talking about. So this is the video you're going to watch. There it is. Okay, that's the video you're going to watch. It's a really good video, all right? Now, um, I want you to... Um, I'm going to I'm going to put a link to this presentation in the in the uh, um, canvas announcement when I post this. But here are a couple of videos you might look at. You know, the the first video humans need not apply. Talk about all the ways that robots are. Yeah, quite frankly, as uh, Sir says, um, they're replacing us in a lot of ways. Well, this first video, we'll talk about how robots are replacing writers. Yeah. And this one talks about how robots are replacing cooks. And I mean, we're talking chefs and imagination and so forth. However, there's also these two videos that I really invite you to watch, where these videos kind of say, hey, not so fast. Don't be too hasty, right? There's a lot of ways in which humans are always going to be needed. Um, this guy talks about why there are still so many jobs when there's so much technology. And, of course, John Oliver here talks about automation. The thing that he says that I think is bang on right is you, you will always be valuable if you can do a series of non-routine tasks that require social intelligence and complex critical thinking and creative problem solving. And you guys already put all that, right? The job you're looking for in the future, the job you want to always be safe and secure is one that should not have routine tasks. 
one that require you to have social intelligence and empathy and emotion, be able to, you know, think critically in complex, wicked problems and solve problems creatively. Um, yeah, coders, right? Although they are replacing coders. You're right. Machines are totally replacing coders. In fact, coders today are coding machines that code. It's it's crazy and nuts. Okay. Um, and let's, oh, hold on. I didn't mean to do that. Stop. I pushed, I pushed the button to actually pull, pull up the presentation. And folks, that's it. Congratulations, we did it. Um, I wanted to be done by 1220. I made it by 12. I admit, I probably went through that too fast. I was anxious to make sure that we got done on time. And as a result, I kind of just fired through it, right? But what I want to do is pause, see if you have any questions, any comments, um, if you'd like any additional insight, and ask if you feel like you're set up for success for this week, because that's what it's all about. So let's see, any questions? Yeah, you're right, encoders, yeah. You'll see some interesting stuff about coders in the um, um, Humans Need Not Apply. Hey, you betcha. Thank you. I appreciate your your contributions and engagement in the in the comments section. I can always rely on you for that. Um, is there an e-portfolio assignment? I can't remember. You will be doing a paper. Um, the here, let's. Um, let me pull this up and we will I'll pull up a new window bear with me folks and we'll come over here let's pull that up i'll show you we'll get there eventually okay So if we come over here to the syllabus where we have all the uh, assignments listed, um, there actually is down here a signature assignment. It's called Signature Assignment Personal Renaissance. That will go in your e-portfolio. Now, I, in my class here, I have you write uh, in a week or so a rough outline for that assignment, and then I have you do a rough draft, and then you can go in and actually create, you know, write your final paper. But yes, that final paper does go into your e-portfolio. So good question there. Okay, so hey, Ahmed, you betcha. Afnan, you bet. Thank you very much, Nawal. Great, Walid, this is tremendous. Thank you, all of you. I really appreciate the engagement. Um, Brock, have you ever seen the Twilight Zone episode about the machines placing the workers of a factory and then eventually the owner of the factory? No, okay, I'm gonna look that one up because we can watch Twilight Zone, I forget, on either Prime or Netflix. I think it's Prime, I'm not sure. But I'll have to look that up because that is. A, and you know what, Brock? That's not crazy because as the video you're going to watch shows, everybody thinks that computers and robots and machines replace blue collar workers. Not anymore. They're starting to replace the white collar workers. So those who like have freaking college degrees and are out there with their swanky, secure, clean, white-collar jobs and thinking they'll never be replaced by a robot? No. They're being replaced. So that episode's not far off. I'll have to look that up and, and watch it. Thank you. That's really cool. All right. I see people dropping off. That's fantastic. I'm going to stay online for just a moment to see if there's any other questions. I did that too quick. 
Otherwise, thank you very much for joining me and we'll see you next week.